Hello everybody and welcome to this short uh, presentation on this open day at the university. So I'm Dr. Daniel Roberts. I'm a lecturer in electronic engineering at the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering. So a little bit about myself before I go on to talk about the history of the transistor. So I actually did an MEng degree in electronic engineering here at the school. So I started in 2008 and finished in 2012. And then I went on to do a PhD in the school in laser physics. And now I'm actually teaching at the school. So I've gone full circle from student and now staff. And many of the staff actually at the school have done something similar. So it shows the welcoming community and the friendliness that we have at the school itself. So I'm sure some of you have visited Bangor already, or if not, you've seen photos of the university. So the big building at the top here is the main university building. And a lot of people, when they walk in for the first time, compare it to Hogwarts, which I think is quite cool. And then down the bottom here, we've got our new Pontio building, which is the university's arts and innovation center. So in there, we've got a couple of restaurants and cafes. We've got a theater and also a cinema as well. So it's got some really good and efficient facilities. And also we've got um, a couple of lecturing rooms. So you might be in there having some lectures if you come to join us here in Bangor. So onto the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering itself. So again, if you've been to Bangor and been to the school, you will have seen this building um, before. But if not, we are down in the lower part of Bangor. So the school of, or the, the electronics part of the school in particular, is the oldest electronic engineering department in the UK. And we also have research excellence at the department. So our staff figure is among the world leaders in a broad range of technologies, which include artificial intelligence, pattern recognition, data visualization, medical microwave electronics and medical simulation, optoelectronics, which is a little bit of my own background when I did laser physics for my PhD, broadband and optical communications, and we've got organic, organic electronics, nanotechnology, and we've also got a new nuclear engine, engineering department as well, just to name a few of the things that we specialise in at the school. So if you came to the school, in your third year project, you would do, well, as the third year project suggests, the project with one of those members of staff specialising in one of those really exciting areas. So what I want to talk to you about during this session or this short 15 minute session is the transistor. Now I'm sure many of you have heard of a transistor before and I hope you're all aware that every single one of you no doubt will have used at least one or if not billions of transistors today. Most of you probably got billions within your pocket which we're going to go into as part of this session. So on the left here, we've got the old version of the transistor, if you like. So that's a, a vacuum tube, or it was also known as a valve. So it's an electronic device used in older radio TVs and amplifiers. So when you see the old kind of TVs that people used to have, they were that big because they had vacuum tubes inside. So all they did was or all they were used for was to control current flow and they were used as switches or as amplifiers. So it was devised by John Ambrose Fleming in 1904, so it's really old. And then it was replaced by this little device here on the right, which is a transistor. So if you came to us in Bangor, we would teach you all about transistors and you do loads of exciting experiments using transistors. So here we have uh, an image of a lot of vacuum tubes included in one device. There's actually almost 400 vacuum tubes in there, uh, in fact. So in 1952, we had what we call the Bull Gamma 3, and this was actually the first generation of tube calculators. So very, very different to what you use or expect to see as a calculator today. So I'm sure it would be a bizarre thought to be wheeling something that big into exam halls ready to do an exam. So we've come a long way since 1952, seeing as you can fit your calculators into your pockets these days or even calculators on your phones, which I'll be talking about a little bit more in a minute. So the transistor actually was invented in 1947 
by these three chaps who were uh, William Shockley, John Bardeen and Walter Bretain. So it was invented or first demonstrated, if you like, in this building here. So I'm sure some of you will be aware what this building is. But it's the Bell Laboratories, which is located on Murray Hill in New Jersey. So I'm sure you'll be aware that this, the Bell Laboratories are named after Graham Alexander Bell for the inventor of the telephone. But the labs are also credited with the invention of or the development of radio astronomy, um, the laser, which I'm sure you're all aware of, the photovoltaic cell, and also the Unix operating system, to name but a few. And it just so happens, it's with the relation to the telephone, it is now owned by the Finnish Nokia company, which we're all uh, very aware of. So just want to go into a bit of background technology, if you like, very briefly. And I'm going to start with a little bit of trivia. So usually if I do this talk uh, in person with students, I ask them who these two guys are. And people usually end up getting the correct answers. So on the right hand side there, we've got Steve Jobs. And then on the left hand side, we've got Steve Wozniak. And of course, they're credited for the invention or the foundation of Apple, which in fact started in the back of Steve Jobs' garage way back in the 70s. Well, I say way back, it's not really that long ago in the grand scheme of things. So the next question I ask is, what's this? And typical answers I get from students in classrooms when I go to schools or in uh, colleges when I do this as um, for sixth form conferences is, what's this? So typical answers are a typewriter or a keyboard, which are, I guess, kind of correct. We can see that we've got some form of keyboard on there. But what we've actually got here is the first Apple computer. So this was the first that was developed by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak back in 1976. So it was sold just as it is here. And there were connections on the back if you wanted to get the screen as an extra addition. So the whole foundation of the Apple Corporation back in the 70s was what Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak wanted home or office computers that were easy to transport and easy to install. So this was the first version that they came up with. So I'll come back to Apple again uh, in a little bit. So I'll explain why I'm talking about Apple a bit later. So another bit of trivia that I ask uh, students is who are these guys so we can ignore the guy in the middle so i'm talking about the guy on the left hand side and the guy on the right and what company they actually founded so usually i get answers such like samsung or microsoft or stuff like that but the clue is actually on the table in terms of the lego and actually the colors of the lego so who we have here are larry page on the right hand side and sergey brin on the left and these guys are actually the founders of Google. So they had a research project where they were both PhD students at Stanford University in California um, in 1996. So Google is in fact older than myself. I won't tell you how old I am, but it's actually a scary thought that I am actually older than Google. So Google was actually founded in the end in 1998. So the colours are a clue there because I'm sure you're all aware of the Google logo and the, the colourful logo that Google presents. But the Lego is a clue because here is the first Lego brick disc box that they built or that Larry Page and Sergey Brin built for their storage for uh, storage server, sorry, for their digital library project as part of their PhD. It then developed into this so this is actually google's first production server which was developed or put into production in 1999 and now of course google today looks a bit like this so this is just one corridor of one of the many buildings that google now has for all of its servers so the point i'm trying to get at is that none of this would have been possible the production of apple and the production of google without the invention of the transistor. So it won't be where we are today without the invention of the transistor and of course without engineers and without computer scientists. 
won't be able to have massive servers like this using vacuum tubes because they would get really, really, really hot and you'd need a building the size of a warehouse to keep it all nice and cool. So I'll get onto that a little bit more later on. So that's Google. So let's go back to Apple. So we've already discussed Apple's first Mac. So in 1976, here it is. So if we just zoom in on the processing board here and on this white chip in particular, we have here the MOS 6502 processor that was clocked at one megahertz. So on this chip, we had a very respectable 3,510 transistors. So we had 3,510 transistors powering that processor on the first Apple Mac computer. So if you look at the actual first production Apple Mac in 1977, so a year later, here we have the Apple II, so it looks or resembles uh, more closely to what we now know as a computer. It had the same processor, so it still had the 3510 transistors on that chip. And you notice the Apple logos here, they are full of colours. So another typical trivia question I ask students is why is the Apple logo full of colours? And I'm sure some of you would know the answer. It's because it's the first PC that was commercially available with a colour screen. So that's why that logo there is full of colours. Now, of course, Apple today is how we all, or many of us know and love, looks like this. So we've got our Apple Macs, we've got our iPads, the iPhones, of course, and more recently, the Apple Watches. So let's just go through a little bit of the history of the iPhone, as I know many millions of people around the world have iPhones. So let's jump to 2013 and the Apple iPhone 5S. So it had the A7 processor on there. So we've gone from 1977, where we had 1,510 transistors, to 2013 where we have one billion transistors on that processor. So it's incredible, in a few short years really, we've gone from thousands of transistors powering our devices to billions of transistors literally in your pocket. So if we jump to 2016, so three years later, we had the iPhone 7, we've gone to the A10 processor, and we've jumped to 3.3 billion transistors. So we've more than tripled in three years. Jump to 2017, we had the iPhone 8, we had the A11 processor, and we had 4.3 billion transistors. So we've gone up an extra billion, not million, but billion transistors. And then to 2018, when I first started doing talks like this, we were at 6.9 billion transistors on the Apple A12 processor. Jump to 2019, we had the iPhone 11 or 11 Pro, which had 8.5 billion transistors on there, so the A13. So we thought we couldn't top that until we got to 2020 with the iPhone 12 or the iPhone 12 Pro. We've also got the Pro Max, I think, as well, haven't we? We've got the A14 processor, and incredibly, we're now up to 11.8 billion transistors. So you can see that's increasing exponentially the more Apple develop, or not just Apple, Samsung as well, actually, to be fair, their processors. So it's incredible to think how far we've come. If we work out we're in 2021 now, and back in 1947, in about 74 short years, how far we've come in the development of technology. So if you think of a pin, just to put into concept how small the transistor is, so this is what a transistor looks like, a three-legged friend we can fit roughly 100 million transistors on the end of a pinhead, which is absolutely incredible. So that's based on a 22 nanometer trigate transistor. Now the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories have actually built a functional one nanometer transistor, which is even more mind blowing. So if we go to the Apollo 11, 
here it is so this was the first uh, spacecraft to take humans to the moon so incredibly apollo 11 was landed on the moon using a computer that had 1300 times less processing power than the iphone 5s so in 2013 or even today if you own an iphone 5s you've got 1300 times more processing power in your pocket than the astronauts had when they landed on the moon which is also mind-blowing they took humans that far and home with computing power less than what you've got in your pockets and substantially less if you've got anything later than the iphone 5s so let's just consider life without the transistor for a second so we'd be back to using vacuum tubes and you'd have a color tv that would need at least two people to lift and took as much power as two kettles to run so a nice shiny samsung qled tv we wouldn't be able to have we would be back to using or we we would still be using rather we would never have had qleds or oleds we'd be back to using the classic big vacuum tube tvs you'd have a huge radio that took around five minutes to warm up and you'd never see a computer because they will be the size of a warehouse as i was discussing earlier and need their own refrigeration plant so here we have the world's oldest original working digital computer which ironically is called the witch so the wolverhampton instrument for teaching computation from harwell so you'd have digital readouts there on a strip of paper that you would have to deduce so coming up on the screen now are all the technologies that you would have to forget about so stuff like sat navs tvs um google maps your computers social media if you're on those if you didn't have transistors then you wouldn't have transistors and wouldn't be able to code anything yeah so you wouldn't have social media or anything like that available to us we can also forget about electronic starting so i'm sure some of you if you if you drive or if your family have got cars if you've got an electronic start button you can forget about those we'd be back to using carburetors like we've got here that would mean that we wouldn't have electric cars which would lead to more air pollution so that photo there is actually uh, from 1920s london so it's not that long ago really compared to where we are today and if you think how much better um, air pollution is i know it's a big thing in the news but if you could imagine that the transistor hadn't been invented how much worse of a position we'd be in today perhaps we wouldn't be here today if you think of operating theater so here we have a nice shiny new operating theater i believe this is in new zealand so you can see that the equipment is nice and small and compact just a couple of screens there and a little bit of equipment to aid the surgeons and doctors in helping patients so if we didn't have the invention of the transistor these are the kinds of hospitals we would still have huge equipment with not much space for the surgeons and doctors and nurses to help the patient so what we have here if it works is a short video which will summarize some of the careers you could get in engineering so it's just a just over a minute long
So hopefully that video summarised quite nicely the very broad range of um, careers you could have if you follow an engineering degree and joined us here at Bang University. So just to name a few, we had robotics, astronomy, the car industry, the airline industry, renewable energy. So it really does open many, many doors for you moving forward if you took a degree um, in electronics or in computing here at Bang University. So if you have any questions, please drop me an email or uh, get in touch with the university or the school and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much.